It's my great pleasure to introduce today's wall speaker, Dr. Gerald Hart. Dr. Hart is Director and Professor of Biological Chemistry at Johns Hopkins Medical School. In preparing my introductory comments, uh, the NIH staff reached out to several of Jerry's former trainees, and um, there, there's some common themes emerged, which I'd like to share with you. Um, and I'll only share the ones that I can share in a public forum. <laughs> um, they commented on his tremendous passion for science in general and, of course, for his work on O. Glucknack in particular. They uniformly pointed out what an amazing spokesperson he has been for the field of glycobiology, um, but not only talking the talk, but walking the walk because of the many, many major contributions that he's made to the field. But interestingly, I also learned that you are a gadgeteer. Um, so that means that whenever a new piece of equipment arrives, you know, he loves gadgets. He's the first one to play with the new gadget in, in the lab. And I have to say that, you know, we, we share that in common I'm sort of thinking maybe you should have become a dentist if you really were. <laughs> anyway, a, a pioneer in, in the field of glycobiology, Jerry did some of the very earliest studies uh, on cell surface heparin sulfate proteoglycans, characterizing the roles of the glycosaminoglycans and hyaluronic acids in the development of corneal transparency and demonstrating, uh, in particular, the importance of the proteoglycan uh, sulfotransferases. Um, in later work, he established a sequon asparaging anything serine or threonine as a minimal structural requirement for recognition by the oligosaccharyl transferase, and indeed his laboratory performed some of the earliest mapping studies of N-glycan attachment sites, demonstrating N-linked protein glycosylation heterogeneity um, as being site-specific and highly regulated uh, by the cellular uh, machinery. Um, now, Jerry has also purified uh, several important glycosyl transferases uh, and then developed methods to use them to probe glycan structures on living cells. And it was while probing cells with glycosyl transferases that Jerry discovered cytoplasmic and nuclear protein glycosylation by O-linked N-acetyl glucosamine, o -glucnac. Since that time, Jerry and his colleagues have characterized the enzymatic machinery that controls the cycling of o -glucnac on and off proteins. They've characterized o glucnacylation and its interplay with phosphorylation on many, many proteins. And they've developed the critical tools that have really enabled the field uh, to move forward. Um, Jerry is really an incredible scientist and statesman who throughout his career has been enormously generous with his time. And I, just on a personal note, and I, I'm sure you don't remember this, but I actually called Jerry in the late 1980s when we were trying to purify a glycosyl transferase, uh, the polypeptide Galnac transferase that initiates mucin biosynthesis. And Jerry very patiently talked us through all the nuances of a general approach that one would take to purify a glycosyl transferase. And then he sent me a Xerox copy of his technician's lab notebook, which included every trick to synthesizing a key affinity matrix. In our case, it was 5 mercury udp and acetylgalactosamine thiopropyl sephirose. Um, and as a result of that generosity of just simply giving me the lab notebook, um, that started us on an effort that has now lasted over 20 years um, on what turned out to be a family of uh, polypeptide galnac transferases, which we continue to this day. And I never thanked you for that, so thank you. Um, Jerry has contributed tremendously to all fields of glycobiology and its importance to human health. It's truly with great pleasure that I welcome him today as the Wall's lecturer. His presentation, Bittersweet Roles of Old Maculation in Diabetes, Alzheimer's Disease, 
and cancer. Dr. Hart. Well, thanks, Larry, for that fantastic, very nice introduction. And I would like to particularly thank the glycoscience community here at NIH for the opportunity to uh, come and give this talk. Uh, Pam, Stan uh, Pam uh, Marino and John Hanover and other people. I'm leaving out everybody. But uh, you've got a great glycobiology group here at NIH, one of the biggest groups in the world, I think. And uh, I hope it keeps growing. So what I'm going to talk about today is a uh, form of protein glycosylation that was discovered uh, back in 1983 by accident while we were studying lymphocyte cellular interactions. And I just want to use this slide to point out that it's different. So most of you grew up reading textbooks, or if you thought about glycans at all, you thought of them as this complicated stuff that's on the outside of cells that has this enormous complexity. And this stuff is really important to virtually everything cells do. But what I'm going to talk about in this seminar is a single monosaccharide on the inside of cells in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So what is O-glucnac? O-glucnac is glucose with an N-acetyl group at the 2 position. Uh, it's about 2 to 5 percent of the glucose that's used by cells goes down the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway to make the donor sugar nucleotide, UDP glucnac. This molecule is second only to ATP in cells in terms of high energy compounds. And it cycles on and off proteins. So this is an enzymatic modification, not to be confused with glycation, which is a chemical modification of proteins that modifies serine and threonines. It's typically not elongated to anything complicated. All it does is cycle on and off proteins. It's exclusively localized for the most part in cytoplasm and nucleus. It's incredibly abundant, as you can see from this 2D gel of a western blot of a HeLa cell nuclear cytoplasmic extract of a, using a pan-specific antibody to this sugar. It's on lots of proteins. It's, fez, it's present in all multicellular organisms studied to date, some bacteria and, and many protozoa, some fungi, plants, and viruses that infect eukaryotic cells. As I said, it's very abundant. Thus far, only about 2,000 proteins have been identified. I think this is actually a fairly small subset. And it's often uh, has a complex relationship with protein phosphorylation that occurs also on serine threonine residues. And in terms of its abundance, it's most highly abundant in the pancreas, then in the brain, and the lowest levels in liver, but the highest dynamic range of this modification occurs in the liver. It cycles on a time scale that's very similar to phosphorylation. Some, on some proteins, it's seconds to minutes that it's cycling. Other proteins, it's very long, depending on the site. And the cycling is controlled by two key enzymes, the O-glucnac transferase and O-glucnacase. Now, it turns out that UDP glucnac is an ideal nutrient sensor that sits at this, at the, uh, as a major node of metabolism. And why do I say that? It's because its synthesis is directly sensitive to glucose, amino acid, fatty acid, and nucleotide metabolism. And I'll come back to this. And this is the donor for the addition of this sugar and the cycling of this sugar on proteins. But it has a complex relationship with phosphorylation. And studies over the past uh, 28 years or so since this has been discovered have, have found that it's important in practically everything the cell does. And just to summarize some of these studies on this, uh, this colorful slide is that it's been shown to be essential for lymphocyte activation been shown to regulate protein-protein interactions, particularly on transcription factors. An area that it's receiving the most attention, where I think it's turning out to be extremely important, is in diabetes, particularly in terms of why glucose is toxic to cells when, when it's present at high levels. It's been shown to be very important in transcription, and I'll say more about this. Jeff Kudlow's group and, and now another group has shown that it seems to regulate the proteasome. If you knock out the gene, of the enzyme that uh, attaches the sugar to proteins. It's required for life even at the single cell level, even in a tissue culture dish in mammals, uh, and also in plants. But it's not essential 
for life in C. elegans, as John Hanover has shown, but the C. elegans actually get very sick. It's been shown to regulate histone methylation, uh, play an important role in HIV infections, neurodegeneration, blocks phosphorylation. There are lots of examples of this. It's important in neuronal plasticity and synaptic functions, regulates protein synthesis. There have been some very nice studies out of a group in Minnesota, uh, Oswieski's group, showing that it regulates gibberellic acid signaling in plants. It's uh, in the short term protective against stress, and then I'll talk a little bit about how it modulates the cell cycle. So I wanted to give an overview a little bit about some of the functional stuff and then talk specifically about a few items uh, that are of more general significance. So Ogluknak is turning out to be important in diabetes. There's been about 1,400 papers linking hexosamine metabolism to diabetes. A breakthrough pa paper uh, work was by Steve Marshall and Don McLean in which they established a direct link in order to get insulin resistance, you had to have the conversion of glucose to glucosamine. And there are lots of examples where hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia dramatically increase the ogluknacylation of many proteins. In fact, the ogluknac transferase is a substrate of the insulin receptor. Uh, Hyperogluknacylation of transcription factors like SP1 play a direct role in glucose toxicity. It directly blocks insulin signaling. If you elevate ogluknac in adipocytes and, 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 and also actually hepatocytes and muscle, it blocks insulin signaling directly. It's been shown that, uh, for example, a specific example of that is in endric, uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthase is activated by a phosphorylation event by AKT at uh, serine 1177, but in diabetics, this molecule often has a glucnac residue on it and cannot be modified by phosphate and doesn't get activated. And a group at Johns Hopkins has shown that this actually plays a role uh, in erectile dysfunction in people with severe diabetes. It also plays a role in, in regulating the transcription of insulin in beta cells. And so three of the major transcription factors that regulate the uh, synthesis and secretion of insulin in beta cells are regulated by ogluknac as well. And then uh, actually John Hanover and Don McLean showed that if you target an overexpression of ogluknac transferase to muscle or fat, it actually causes a, a diabetic phenotype. And then there's been uh, genetic studies in human that, uh, in uh, uh, polymorphisms in the enzyme that removes ogluknac that also support a role for it in ogluknac in uh, diabetes. And then. It's also very recently an area that's taken off is a, a role of it in cancer, and I'm not going to go through these step by step, but it's been shown to be important in various functions in breast cancer, thyroid cancers, uh, uh, tumor suppressors such as P53 and RB are regulated by glucnac, and recently we found that it's strikingly upregulated in prostate cancer cells. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of uh, how, how this may turn out to be significant for actual patients. So we, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Spanner in, uh, in uh, Canada, who is a, a, a real physician that sees patients every day, uh, and I don't even know what possessed him to do this, but he decided to look at ogluknacylation in the lymphocytes of his patients. And he found this striking result that individuals that have chronic lymphocytic leukemia, ogluknac in the enzymes, OGT and ogluknac ACE, are dramatically elevated in individuals with lymphocytic leukemia. But this study became even more interesting because when you looked at the prognosis of individuals, all ogluknac is elevated in all of the patients, but there's a spectrum. Uh, patients that uh, have a low end of the high end have a very bad prognosis, and those that have very high levels of ogluknac have a good prognosis. And uh, I knew I was going to do that. And Basically, the, the gist of this is, is it, and they looked at some signaling pathways, and when it turns out that the ogluknac levels become very high in those cells, it actually shuts off the signaling cascades that regulate growth, like AKT signaling and other pathways. And so there's this uh, window where when it gets really high, the cells become indolent and the patients survive. When it's high at the low end, they don't do so well. Okay, so with that uh, little bit of functional introduction, I'm going to talk about ogluknac's role in transcription, the cycling enzymes, 
show you that it has ex very extensive and surprising crosstalk with phosphorylation. And in fact, one of the mechanisms of this is the kinases themselves we're finding. Many of them are modified and regulated by oglipnac, and at the end I'll talk about how oglipnac regulates cell division. So clear back in 1989, we were looking at the distribution of oglipnac in chromatin using polyteen chromosomes in the fruit fly as a model, and you can see that the oglipnac is abundantly distributed throughout the length of the chromosome, and its localization correlated with active sites of gene transcription. And then uh, Frank Comer, who's in the audience today, and Bill Kelly, a former graduate student, were studying RNA polymerase II in collaboration with Mike Domas uh, at uh, UC Davis, and found that this form of RNA polymerase II called 2A, which has this signature 7-amino acid repeat at C terminus, is extensively glycosylated as many as, in fact, in our early studies, as many as three glucnacs per site, but most commonly it's located at this threonine residue. And then Brian Lewis, more recently here at the NIH, has done a very outstanding uh, study, which indicates that the pre-initiation complex assembly appears to require the presence of this sugar in elongation, which uh, is uh, triggered by phosphorylation of these CTD, uh, which triggers the, allows the elongation event, uh, uh, requires removal of the sugar. And he's also shown that you can block this process with specific inhibitors of the enzymes that remove oglipnac. And uh, I think this is a, an important, not only paradigm for RNA polymerase II, but it's a, 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 an example of a theme that is emerging, that, it's, that many of these signaling, phosphorylation signaling cascades are not just phosphate on, phosphate off, but are actually uh, involving glucnac on, glucnac off before you can put the phosphate on. So as I said, many if not most transcription factors, in fact all of them that have been looked at in any detail for RNA polymerase II are glucnacylated, and this cartoon just shows that. And it's turning out that uh, oglucnac is uh, going to be a major player in transcription because, for example, the oglucnac transferase has recently been shown by two papers, one in PNAS and one in science, that it's a polycomb gene. What does that mean? It means that it's a master regulator of development in terms of whole subsets of genes, uh, particularly ones called Hox genes. And then recently, uh, Caro Sakabi, a graduate student in the lab as part of her thesis, showed that histones, in fact, are modified by oglucnac, and oglucnac is part of the so-called histone code. What this rather complicated slide shows is that Caro uh, as I want to make graduate students do, used every e technique in the universe to show that, in fact, these were indeed glucnacylated proteins. So she used chemienzymatic tagging with clicket chemistry, tritiated enzymatic labeling with UDP-GAL on top of the sugar and autoradiography, antibodies, multiple antibodies against oglucnac, uh, overexpressed proteins with flag tags and then probing for oglucnac. And in these 2D gels, she also showed that hyperacetylated cells grown in butyrate uh, become hyperacetylated on their histones, and they're also modified by uh, oglucnac. But this study became particularly interesting because when we did the site mapping, we asked where are the glucnac residues on histones, well, a few of the sites are indeed on the histone tail, where the so-called histone code is located, but several of the sites are, in fact, in the exact region where DNA interacts with the histone. And this is particularly interesting because I'll show you in a minute how big this molecule is. Uh, and you might think it's just a structural uh, modification of histones, but that's not true because if you look at the cell cycle, here's an example with uh, histone H3. You can see during the cell cycle, asynchronous, early M, late M, and G1, the glucnacylation of this protein goes down and then back up again. Similarly, if you Look at heat shock. If you expose cells to 45 degrees for a few minutes, let them recover, and then look at what's going on uh, with glucnacylation again of the histones. You can see it goes up and then back down again. So it's clearly cycling. And if you overexpress these, the enzyme that adds oglucnac about twofold in cells, it actually causes aberrant histone modifications. For example, uh, histone H3 uh, lysine 9 acetylation goes up. Histone H3 serine 10 phosphorylation, this is actually a very key regulatory site, goes down. Methylation goes down. 
and, and this methylation at this site goes up. And then recently, a very exciting paper just appeared in uh, Science Magazine showing that gluconacylation of H2B at serine 112 actually uh, regulates or facilitates uh, its monoubiquitination, which actually is an activation event for histones. And these uh, people who in this paper showed that the glucnac is actually the binding site for the H2B ubiquitin lycase that actually uh, puts the ubiquitin on the protein. So again, there's crosstalk between all of these different post-translational modifications. Very briefly say so something about the enzymes involved in cycling. They're two incredibly interesting uh, uh, proteins. I'm totally unbiased by that. Uh, there's the transferase, uh, which is a two-domain protein. The, the catalytic subunit evolved from glycogen phosphorylase, but it has these TPR repeats. These are long protein docking domains. And this is very important for how this enzyme works. The enzyme that removes O-glucnac, O-glucnacase, also has two domains. Uh, one is the catalytic part that removes the sugar, and the other is a histone acetyltransferase domain that most of us in the field, despite publications to the contrary, uh, think is not enzymatically active but plays a role in targeting the enzyme to chromatin. During the late stages of apoptosis, caspase 3, the executioner caspase, actually cleaves this molecule in half and uh, the, in the o ace half remains active. The o transferase is about 80% nuclear, 20% cytoplasmic, depending on the cell type, but it's mostly a nuclear enzyme, whereas the enzyme that removes o uh, it's located other places, including the mitochondria, as John has shown, uh, but uh, if you, it's all, the o ace is also mostly cytoplasmic and less in the nucleus. The interesting thing is, is that the, the proportion that's in the nucleus of o ace is actually highly loca located in the nucleolus. And uh, a graduate student uh, in my lab, Kira Zayden, has shown that uh, o gluknac plays a direct role in ribosome biogenesis and at least 20 ribosome proteins are modified. And, uh, this is an ongoing project, but it's, so it's definitely involved in uh, ribosome assembly. Now, I'll just come back to this uh, UDP glucnac as a nutrient sensor, because this is the donor, and it turns out that the o transferase is exquisitely sensitive from nanomolar up to the solubility of UDP glucnac. And the reason it's so, so critical to, as a node in meta metabolism, is it's directly regulated by nucleotide, energy, glucose, amino acid, and fatty acid metabolism, all of which affect the levels of this sugar donor in the cell. And just to give you an example of this, as I, I like to show this, particularly to people working on signaling and transcription, is that most people doing these studies use tissue culture cells in their studies. They grow their tissue culture cells in diabetic conditions. If you look at the composition of tissue culture media, it's typically 20 to 30 millimolar glucose. The normal level of glucose is about 5 millimolar. And just to give you a, an example of that, this is Jercat cells grown in 5 millimolar glucose. And the proteins are normalized. I'm not showing you those. But at this level of glucose and this exposure, now I could expose this till it was completely black with thousand spots, but at this level of exposure, this would be the mountaintops. However, if you grow these same cells for a short period of time in 30 millimolar glucose, you can see the extent of oglucnacylation has gone up dramatically. Now, if I was studying signaling and transcription and I was growing my cells in diabetic conditions, I might worry about this a little bit, although we don't know enough about what this is doing, but we, it clearly is affecting many signaling pathways and also transcription. So originally, the o transferase was cloned in a bacterial analog, and this is a structure, a car, and this slide was actually provided me, to me by Don Van Alten at Dundee, and it's a beautiful structure. You can see this. In fact, when Don first showed this, he had it positioned over a wine bottle and, and opening up like it was a corkscrew. Uh, this is the catalytic domain. These are the TPR repeats that are highly conserved. And the importance of these are these are the, where all the proteins bind that actually target this enzyme to various substrates. Very recently, Susan Walker lab, uh, Laboratory at Harvard has done the structure of the human enzyme, and you'll note that it's very similar, except that in their model, it actually is more like a hinge where the uh, targeting proteins and substrates bind, and this hinge opens up 
to allow access to the active site. And so we are beginning to understand how this enzyme works. Now, I always get asked at seminars, there's 500 kinases and there's only one OGT, and, and, and if they're uh, modifying similar number of proteins, how is that possible? Well, it turns out there are multiple many o gluconate transferases, it's just that they exist as transient holoenzymes. And so some of the targeting proteins we've begun to study using yeast-2 hybrid analysis, for example, as a start. Uh, these are proteins that interact with the TPR repeat domain and other regions in the, uh, in the enzyme and target it to specific substrates. So there are ones that have been shown to be involved in transcription or development, motor proteins. And for example, one of the ones that uh, Lance Wells worked on was protein phosphatases are associated with OGT. And what his study showed was actually in many instances the same enzyme that removes the phosphate adds the gluconac probably without ever letting go of the substrate. As it, one example of this was a work by Mike Housley when he was a student in collaboration with Per Pouchevé and Joe Rogers, looking at uh, a regulation of gluconeogenesis by FOXO. So it was known for many years since the 50s that people who had diabetes and had high glucose in their blood, you would think their liver would stop making glucose, but that's not what happens. When the glucose gets high, gluconeogenesis is actually elevated. And what happens is, uh, in terms of normal regulation, is the insulin receptor, insulin binds to the insulin receptor, triggers the cascade that activates the AKT kinase, and under, in normal cells, uh, this then phosphorylates three key sites on FOXO, causing it to leave the nucleus and shuts off uh, transcription of the rate-limiting steps of gluconeogenesis. Uh, so during the uh, normal state, FOXO is bound to a, a co-activator called PGC1-alpha that was discovered by Bruce Spiegelman, and it's this complex that then activates gluconeogenesis. So I'm not going to show you the data, but just to give you the model that resulted from this. It turns out that PGC1-alpha is one of these targeting proteins. And work uh, from Montmagny's lab has also shown that CRTC2 or TORC2 is an, also a targeting protein. And the way this regulation of gluconeogenesis works is under high glucose conditions, UDP glucanic pools go up, and by mechanisms that we don't fully understand yet, OGT gluconacylates CRTC2 causing it to go into the nucleus or activate it, which it then associates with CREB, transcriptionally activates PGC1-alpha, which associates with OGT, causes it to become specific for FOXO, and the gluconacylated form of FOXO, completely independent of whether it has those three uh, AKT phosphorylation sites or not, goes into the nucleus and activates PEPCK and G6PC, uh, the rate-limiting steps of gluconeogenesis. Why would the liver do this? Well, the liver is responding to oxidative stress due to the high glucose levels and mitochondrial dysfunction, and it's probably trying to survive. So this is a short-term stress response because at the same time that these are being elevated, which are affecting other cell types in the body, manganese, SOD, and catalase are also regulated by this system, and these are the enzymes that detoxify oxygen radicals. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is this crosstalk between gluconacylation and phosphorylation and how surprisingly extensive it is. So what do I mean by that? So there are proteins where, many proteins, where the phosphate residue and the gluconac residues reciprocally occupy the same hydroxyl group, such as the CMYK oncogene. There are other proteins where they have reciprocal occupancy, but they're at different sites. In other words, if the gluconac is in proximity of a phosphorylation site, it can't be phosphorylated. There are other proteins like the insulin receptor substrate that is basically a scaffold for every kind of modification you can think of that is gluconacylated and phosphorylated simultaneously, and, and these individual molecular species seem to modulate insulin signaling in ways we don't understand yet. And then I'm going to talk about CAM kinase 4, so I'll, it's another example. So, What's the outcome of just, so there's over 440 post-translational modifications known. There's no example I'm aware of of a protein that's not post-translationally modified. And I think the molecular diversity of, that's created by post-translational modification is illustrated by this simple idea that if you have 10 modification sites on a protein 
and it were only phosphorylated or dephosphorylated, the molecular diversity of that protein would be this little yellow line down here. Whereas if you just added another one that was about the same abundance, like oglipnac, at these same sites, the molecular diversity gets astronomical in a hurry. And of course, if you start talking about ubiquitination, acetylation, methylation, and every other Asian, it's, uh, the, the molecular diversity becomes enormous in a, in a hurry. So I'll give you an example of uh, the CMYK oncogene. So we were studying the CMYK oncogene glipnacylation, and we mapped the glipnac site. And sure enough, at major site, turned out to be 3858. Why is that important? Well, that's the major phosphorylation site for GSK3 kina, kinase beta. And if you look at the mutations in human lymphomas that occur that cause cancer, cause this protein to become an oncogene, is, this is 3 and 58. And this is significant because this is the transactivation domain of the transcription factor. And the growth factor signaling cascade uh, via ERK kinase and GSK3 beta uh, I mean, and, and ERK kinase, sorry, phosphorylates serine 62, and then and only then does this become a priming site for GSK3 beta to phosphorylate 58. What we found using site specific antibodies and other approaches in a non growing cell, there's a glipnac at 58, and if you stimulate the cell to grow with growth factors or serum as fast as you can measure it, faster than we can measure it, the glipnac is no longer there and there's a phosphate at 58. So it's again an example of this hierarchical relationship. And there's some uh, preliminary data that shows that this glipnac at 58 plays a role in the interaction of this protein with the RBP107 tumor suppressor. So we wanted to ask a simple question about this relationship with phosphorylation and we decided to take advantage of recent developments in mass spec technology and we asked, in the absence of any other stimuli, if we just took tissue culture cells, in this case NIH3T3 cells, and exposed them for a short term to an inhibitor of the enzyme that removes oglipnac, and this globally elevates oglipnac about two to three fold on hundreds if not thousands of proteins, and then ask, okay, what does that do to site-specific phosphorylation? So this looks complicated, but it's not. It's basically a, a, a workflow for doing this experiment. So the assumptions we made was if a phosphate site was not affected by high levels of okadaic acid, this is a phosphatase inhibitor, then it's probably not cycling. And then we used oglipnac ACE inhibitors to elevate oglipnac. Then we uh, purified the phosphoproteins using immobilized metal ion chromatography, and then we purified after protease digestion, phosphopeptides using titanium dioxide, and these were tagged with these methods that allow you to do multiplexed quantitation in a mass spectrometer called ITRAC, and then you can calculate not only the site occupancy but the extent of the protein abundance and, and get what we call an occupancy, a relative occupancy ratio at individual sites. And the way this data looks is this is a site that's not cycling, so for example, in the presence of okadaic acid, it doesn't change. This would just happen to be on IRS uh, 2. Here's a site that is cycling, that okadaic acid made it go up, and inhibitors of oglipnac ACE, which elevated oglipnac, made it go down. So in analyzing this, we analyzed about 700 phosphorylations identified and quantified. This is work by a really outstanding graduate student, Zihao Wang. We found in non-stimulated cells, not surprisingly, about 48% of the sites are not, are not cycling. But at the time, what was really striking was we were expecting, uh, you know, not these huge changes. All of the sites virtually that were cycling were affected by oglipnac. 280 went down and 148 went up. And these went, the ones that went up were particularly surprising because at the time we were thinking that these were sort of reciprocal modifications, but it obviously is more complicated than that. Well, why is it more complicated than that? Well, it turns out that many kinases, this was a, a screen that was done by Wagner Diaz when he was a postdoc in the lab, are, uh, keep touching that keyboard, where many kinases are modified by oglipnac. And so far, the ones that have been studied are, in fact, regulated by it. And I'll give you a couple examples uh, of that that we're moving on. So the first one is CAM kinase 4. This is a very important kinase, particularly in nervous system and in beta cells. 
It's regulated by calcium calmodulin, cam kinase kinase. Phosphorylates a critical residue at 3 and E200 to activate it. When it's activated, it phosphorylates a bunch of transcription factors, particularly CREB, and turns them on. And we map the major sites of oglucnac on this kinase, and the important one that I'm going to talk about is serine 189. So if you take neurons and you depolarize them using ionophores, the, this kinase becomes activated. You can see the phosphorylation at T200 goes up. And concomitant with this increase, there's a decrease in glucnacylation at serine 189. Uh, and in addition to that, the phosphorylated activated form of this enzyme binds o ace specifically. And if you mutate the 3 and 200 site, the phosphorylation site, to an alanine, the level of o at the 189 site goes way up. And importantly, if you mutate the 189 site, to an alanine to prevent it from being oglucnacylated, the enzyme becomes constitutively active and very active on the Krebs uh, uh, transcription factor. And also, the mutated uh, kinase that is missing the glucnac at 189 has a much higher affinity for ATP. And why is that? Well, if you look at the uh, model of the structure of the uh, CAM kinase 4 and ask where is the glucnac residue at serine 189, it turns out that it's right in the middle of the ATP binding pocket. In other words, if this kinase has a glucnac present at 189, it's a dead enzyme. It can't even bind ATP. And if, just to give you a feel for the difference, this is a, a space filling model of a phosphate sitting on CAM kinase 4 and this is a space filling model of glucnac sitting on so glucnac is about five times the Stokes radius of a phosphate, even though it doesn't have a charge. Well, this led to this uh, model because Song et al. back in 2007 showed that CAM kinase 4 itself phosphorylates OGT and activates it. So it turns out that CAM kinase 4 is sitting in the membrane with glucnacs on it, a dead enzyme, and before it can get activated, this glucnac residue has to be removed and then it gets phosphorylated and activated. It's a two-step mechanism. And when it's activated, it goes back and phosphorylates OGT and resets the cycle. And this is sort of an emerging theme that this is sort of like a safety valve or a two-step mechanism for turning on and turning off enzymes. And the advantage of this, of course, maybe to the cell is it makes it more sensitive to nutrient status as a well, in addition to activity of kinases. Another example, I'm going to talk about some uh, recent unpublished work on uh, protein kinase casein, used to be called casein kinase 2. This protein is glucnacylated. This is the enzymatic activity in vitro, and you can see that it binds to a lectin that recognizes glucnac. You can elude it off. You can see that the glucnac sites are located on the alpha and alpha prime subunits and not on the beta. You can then make the peptides. And back then when we did, we actually did this site mapping many years ago, we were using manual Edmund degradation, believe it or not, to map sites, uh, which meant the student that did this had to spend like 15 hours in the hood uh, doing this, so that's cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, but anyway, this Glucknack site got mapped to uh, serine 347. And so Phil Cole's lab, who's one of the world's experts at doing chemical ligation of proteins, uh, did this where they made the recombinant 1 to 341 and then coupled to it various modified forms of the region that contains these modification sites. So they were able to make the phospho form and the glucnac form and other forms of this enzyme. And what was really striking about this, uh, first of all, the, just to show you that the th uh, uh, presence of a glucnac at 347 prevents phosphorylation at 344. This is a very common uh, theme. But what was really striking, and I think is going to have long-term, almost profound implications to our understanding of signaling, is that the, the casein kinase 2 with the glucnac on it has different substrate specificity than casein kinase 2 with a phosphate on it. And uh, so this is an example of these kind of data. The way this was done was with a large protein array with a different isomeric species of the enzymes and asked, what are the substrates with this species? What are the substrates for that species? So you can see S adenosyl homocysteine lyase is actually a really good substrate for the O-glucnac isoform, but not for the phospho. 
However, this enzyme, nucleus assembly protein 1, is a good substrate for the phospho form, but not for the glyco. And this array uh, revealed a number of proteins that had these properties, uh, whether they, it was just the alpha subunit alone or the alpha beta together, whereas the glucnac form, phospho form, had all different substrate specificities. And I think that this is coming out in nature chemical biology, but I think it's going to be very important in our view of uh, um, the regulation of the specificity of these enzymes by post-translational modifications. So the basic I idea is, is that the enzyme specificity is in part controlled by its modifications. Uh, so when it has a glucnac at 347, it hits a bunch of substrates that are different than when it hits when it's mo unmodified or when it's modified uh, by phosphate residues. Okay, the very last thing I want to talk about is, is give you an example of how the crosstalk between these different modifications is important in a cellular process. Uh, and the example I'm going to talk about is cytokinesis. So we uh, knew a while back that if you overexpressed O-glucnac transferase about twofold, cells become polyploid. This is a very common feature of cancer cells, by the way. So nuclear division is proceeding normally, but cytokinesin cytokinesis or cell division is not, and so you get multinucleated cells. And, we, and Chad Slauson, a postdoc in the lab who's now at uh, Kansas University Medical Center on the faculty, did this w very nice work where he showed that during the cell cycle, the oglucnac transferase becomes highly enriched at the mid-body, right when the cells are getting ready to uh, pinch off. And this just uh, shows another illustration of how enriched these, this enzyme gets at the tubule. And if you overexpress the oglucnac transferase in cells, even two to threefold, you get this huge increase in glucnacylation and a concomitant decrease in proline-directed phosphorylation as measured by a proline-directed phosphate-specific antibody. In addition to this, this sort of illustrates how the oglucnac transferase works in that if you look at asynchronous cells, which are not at this stage of the cell cycle, and you ask, and you do an immunoprecipitation with a, an important kinase that's involved in cell division, the only thing you bring down is the kinase. But if you look at the specific stage of the cell cycle where they're getting ready to undergo this cell division event, and you do the same experiment, you bring, you bring down this complex of enzymes that contain oglucnacase, OGT, polokinase, aurora kinase, protein phosphatases, same thing if you do OGT, you bring down in asynchronous cells predominantly OGT, whereas at this stage, when this complex forms, you bring down this complex. And we're beginning to understand some of the substrates of this complex, like vimentin and other things that are modified, both by glucnacylation and phosphorylation at this uh, cleavage event. But we wanted to know more detail about what is going on. How come elevating OGT twofold in a cell causes cytokinesis not to work. So we, did, again, uh, decided, and we, it, took, it turns out, I'll just mention that classical mass spectrometry methods do not work for oglucnac. Uh, I've, I've had a mass spec lab, some of the best in the world, are un, unable to detect the modification. So you have to use other methods, and I could talk a little bit about why that is. But, Anyway, we developed this rather complicated method that involves tagging uh, the glucnac residue chemienzymatically, and this made use of uh, Dr. Kospa's mutant gal transferase he generously provided us, and, I, and there's now actually a kit, I think, the uh, company sells, where you can enzymatically attach a UDP, a ga, a, a ga, an, an azido-galactose to the glucnac residue. And then, when, and then you can use a UV cleavable biotin tag to tag it, do affinity chromatography, release it off the affinity column with UV light, and you get a peptide with this unique structure on it. The beauty of this structure is you can do, then do classical collision-induced fragmentation and identify the peptides that have this, and then you can go and find out by separating the phospho and the glyco together you can quantify occupancy of both the sites. And so in this study, we quantified occupancy at about 320 phospho sites and about 450 SILAC pairs of glucnac sites present at the mid-body. And this was published in Science Signaling. Well, the, the take-home message of this, though, was 
when, and it took like almost a year to analyze all the data that came from this in terms of the signaling pathways, which is sort of normal for this type of study. But what came out of this was striking. So you all know that cyclin-dependent kinase is the master regulator of cell division. So what happens when you elevate oglipnac twofold? Well, one of the things that happens is it decreases the transcription of polokinase 1. It decreases the messenger RNA, but it didn't alter the phosphorylation of this protein. The resulting effect of this was to decrease the phosphorylation of this MYT1 protein and also to decrease the amount of CDC25. The effect of these two were to upregulate two inhibitory phosphate, uh, key regulatory inhibitory phosphate events on CDK1. This results in downregulation of all the phosphorylation targets of CDK1 and probably majorly affects cytokinesis. And you can do the same thing for the circuits of aurora kinase and polokinase and you s come to similar conclusions. So both transcriptional events and phosphorylation events are involved in regulating this process. So in conclusion, uh, uh, what I've described is that oglipnac is a major regulatory post-translational modification in all multicellular eukaryotes, plants, animals, viruses, and in some bacteria. It's required for life in mammals and plants. Plants actually have two oglipnac transferases. The crosstalk and interplay between oglipnac elation and phosphorylation is extensive and involved in many cellular processes. It's turning out to be very important in transcription, and I think someday the transcription community is going to wake up to this fact. It's part of the histone code where most sites or many sites are actually in contact re regions with the DNA. It serves as a metabolic sensor that regulates signaling and transcription in response mainly to nutrients and also to stress. And we think that, that one of the major areas where this is going to impact medicine is that it, it really explains why high glucose can be so toxic as in long-term effects of diabetes. And that's one of the thrusts of our lab is to get at what the mechanism of glucose toxicity. And then more recently, it's become striking that uh, oglipnacylation is dramatically elevated in every cancer so far that I know of that's been looked at. We have no idea what that means necessarily but I think it's going to play a major role in molecular processes leading to cancer. And so this is a uh, now old picture, even, even Frank's still in it, uh, of, the, of the lab. I clearly need to take a, a new picture. Uh, we collaborate with Perry Pouchevet's lab. We've been working with Don Hunt's lab for a while now, working on developing mass spec methods to study oglipnac. And we have a very nice project going on on diabetic cardiomyopathy with Ann Murphy and uh, Pinero Romero's Korea here, outstanding guy, uh, looking at diabetic cardiomyopathy. I just didn't have time to uh, talk about that today. Uh, I think that's it. Oops. Thank you. So, is there any way we could measure this status of your uh, black neck lation of the proteins? Uh, recently, I found out that I became a diabetic, so obviously I have some interest in this issue. When we measure hemoglobin A1c, is that a true measure of the end glycosylation of the proteins, hemoglobin, and the rest of the body? Uh, so I didn't, I didn't talk about any of this, but we've had a study going on where we're, we're looking at using oglipnac as a diagnostic tool, particularly from human red cells. The data looks very promising, uh, and the, the beauty of it is, is you can detect the elevation of both oglipnac at specific sites on proteins and the elevation of oglipnac ACE, fairly striking, in human red cells well before hemoglobin A1C becomes positive. When hemoglobin A1C becomes positive, it, you've already got diabetes, and it's pretty late in the process, whereas what would be really nice is if you could detect it, you know, six months to a year before you become A1C positive, and then maybe you could change people's lifestyle, get them to exercise, quit eating cheeseburgers, whatever. Well, some of us are sinners, so it's difficult to control the sugar. 
So the question I have is there is a good similarity of the splenda with the glucose. So does splenda have any effect on this uh, process of end glycosylation and all the other things of protein? So I, I didn't, I'm not sure I understood the, experiment, the question, but the oglipnac levels are sensitive not only to glucose, but to amino acids, lipids, fatty acids. I mean, uh, all these things cause it to go up in uh, different mechanisms probably, but it, it's elevated in all of them. And, and it, we know for a fact in diabetic individuals it's elevated. No, also, it's question, also elevated in people that eat glucosamine. My question is relates to the Splenda, which is a sugar substitute. If you look at the structure of Splenda, it is a good yeah, similarity I don't, to I the don't, glucose. It's never been looked at, but I wouldn't predict Splenda would elevate it, but it's never been looked at that I know of. Thank you. Oh, okay. So Larry wants me to expand on that, what we know about the control of cycling. Uh, very little, actually. The, uh, so based on a number of studies uh, by our lab and John's lab and others that suggest that one of the things that's becoming clear, and I think the phosphorylation people are coming to grips to this as well, is that it's not necessarily the stoichiometry that's important for the biology, it's the cycling rate. And, and in fact, it, and we know that if you knock down OGT, the oglipnac ACE goes down in parallel, even though they're on different chromosomes, which is kind of bizarre. So the cell wants to keep the ratio the same. Um, we know that the, en that the enzyme is activated by tyrosine phosphorylation, oglipnac transferase. Uh, we know that, that, that it looks like its specificity is regulated by targeting, but a lot more work has to be done on that. Um, and, then what, and then a lot of times, particularly in transcription complexes, OGT and OGA are found in the same complex. So we want, there has to be a switch, otherwise you get a feudal cycle. So uh, we don't know what that's all about either. I, got one. Oh, I have one more question. Um, so Jerry, just to follow up on that, um, given that both enzymes appear to be sort of co-regulated, what do you think, um, which, which ones should be targeted for therapeutic benefit in terms of diabetes or neurodegeneration? Uh, well, I actually think there's a possibility that, it, that if you lower activity or amount of OGT by 30% or so, that could be really good for diabetes. The problem is, you know, what about Alzheimer's disease? So it, it all depends. I mean, it depends on the tissue. Uh, I think that, to me, the best targets, the, the example I would give is if you could block PGC1-alpha's interaction with OGT, then you might have a good drug to stop the high levels of gluconeogenesis in the liver, which would help gly hyperglycemia. Now, those kind of drugs are very hard to make, I'm told, because they're involving protein-protein interaction targets, but I think small molecule stuff will work with that. And I think you could probably do a high throughput screen and find something even, but, uh, I, and, and then OGA is, uh, I think, a pretty good target as well. Um, I mean, one of the things, that, so I didn't talk about any of the work on cardiology stuff, but the, uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of cardiologists interested in this because if you elevate oglipnac in the short term, even after a heart attack in animal models, it actually spares the heart damage. Uh, it's cardioprotective, so, uh, you know, maybe eating glucosamine is a good thing, I don't know, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting area. So there's a, there's a paradox, so it's bad in the long term and good in the short term, so. 